Good morning. I'm Joan Rabbits. I am the principal consultant for Renaissance Consulting Group. And I'm going to talk this morning about some emerging storage technologies that really in the media and entertainment space could be implemented today and probably should be implemented right now. So why NVMe and what is NVMe anyway? Why is it so important to the next generation of storage architectures? Well, a little history lesson, NVMe was invented uh, as a new protocol by Intel six or seven years ago. And it was intended to replace the protocol that's used inside the compute node between the compute and memory part and the storage part of the node. Um, the, there's a bus that goes from compute and memory, the memory bus, and there had to be a separate one to go to storage because storage was so much slower. And it was designed for hard drives. Now the world's changed and they knew this was going to happen, that um, hard drives were going to get replaced by flash. And flash is not as fast as memory, but a whole lot closer. And there is a long-term goal of having only one bus inside a compute node from compute to memory to storage. We're not there yet, but they defined a new protocol to go from compute memory to storage. And uh, the old one was a version of SATA. It's called AHCI. It's actually a generic protocol. And the new one is NVMe. So NVMe was designed to allow us to go approximately five times faster in um, communicating inside your compute node with storage. And that allows us to support flash and in the future, even hybrid memories of different types. Um, so that's all great. Um, what is NVMe over fabric? That's when we said, huh, that bus is faster, but now I'd like to have some distributed storage, not all inside one node. And so now I need to take that protocol and slide it over a network. So NVMe over Fabric says, hey, take that really cool, fast enough protocol that Intel invented and make it work over a network. Um, and it has a second side effect that's actually very important for compute, not, not so much for storage. I mean, it's great for storage, but uh, the secondary side effect is it's designed as a protocol to avoid using the CPU. Um, so we call that RDMA. And that means direct, you write from, from, the, from one side, you don't put things in a buffer, you actually write it right into the memory or the storage on the other side. And um, so this picture actually sort of illustrates graphically, but also kind of gives you a visual picture of how things work today. In the iSCSI world, um, the, if you're on the side that's requesting data, you, you have to do these four protocol translations, and each one of them gets buffered up. Then it gets passed over the network, and it gets buffered up on the other side, and then unbuffered. And, and that takes a lot of time, and uses a lot of CPU resources. Um, so, so RDMA is designed to skip all that. They basically say, here's the space in memory, you just go right, right into it. And it allows us to go right, right into storage when storage is flash. So it has a side effect of not only speeding up access to storage, it also allows us to have storage that's distributed because we can do this over a network, we can be on a network writing in other people's memory spaces, and we can do it without touching the CPU. So if I've got a thousand compute nodes and they're all doing a whole lot of data movement and data storage, which is very typical in media and entertainment, it's not consuming the same CPUs or GPUs that are being used for editing, for example. So it's a double win, it's a huge win. Um, so not surprising, there's a whole bunch of companies that are building around these possibilities. They're building software defined solutions for storage. They're taking advantage of NVMe and flash memory and um, building, or flash drives, essentially, and building new types of architectures. Now, I'm going to use some company names and their examples, um, but there are many more. Um, there's nothing special about the ones I chose. So one example I'm going to show is Accelero. It's a company that has software-defined storage. Uh, their product is called NV Mesh, and they present block storage. So it's a bunch of software. When you have it running on your system, it looks to, to you like you're getting local block storage devices. Um, they just happen to be massive because they're aggregated from however many nodes you have on your system, all that storage is aggregated and can be presented to you as if it's local to you. 
Um, so you'll notice some common characteristics that we're going to see here in, in some of the other examples. They present logical volumes, in this case at a block level, and the advantage of this solution is that you could put a, your own file system or your own parallel file system on top of it, and of course the applications have no idea that this is all going on under the covers. Um, it runs on top of any Linux operating system, and it can run on any old server, right? So that's what software-defined means. Um, now, how do they turn that into a solution? The way this works, and you're going to see this picture a couple more times because they all kind of work similarly. Uh, the differences are subtle. Um, on the side of the requester who needs access to storage, where I'm doing my video editing, I need to pull in some storage. That's the client. Now, the client and the target could be the same, but the client side is requesting. He has a very lightweight block driver, a lightweight chunk of software that is accessed right as part of the operating system, so you don't even notice it. And in this case, that software talks to a special network interface card, an RNIC. That means it's a network interface card that's RDMA capable. That means that it could be running InfiniBand or it could be running something called Rocky, which is RDMA over Ethernet. And on top of that is where you would potentially ride NVMe over Fabric. So a lot of gobbledygook, but at the end of the day, there's a network, there's a high-speed way to talk on that network, and the client and the, and the target talk to each other over the network, and that's how they negotiate moving the storage bits. Um, and and there, you do need some kind of NIC that's RDM capable, uh, which anyone can put in these compute nodes. On the target side is where the storage is, right? And on that side, I've got an NVMe capable drive. And notice they've got this protocol called RDDA. That's their proprietary version of NVMe over Fabric because it's not a full-on, fully deployed standard everywhere yet. And you notice how it's going around the CPU. So uh, data is being pulled off these flash drives uh, into a NIC that is putting it right in the memory on the client side, and they're using no CPU to do it. Right? And this is a common architecture. Now this is logical, the client and the target. So they could both be, I'm going to show you another example here. Both they could be together. So it could be um, if you, for example, if you want to go hyperscale, your storage nodes would just have storage and your client nodes would just have applications and clients on them, that would be called hyperscale. Um, and then if you want to grow storage, you add storage nodes, and if you want to grow compute, you add compute nodes. Um, alternatively, they could be deployed this way. So this is hyperconverged. I take the client and the target and I smash them together, and every node has a client so you can go and request data, and it has a target so you can manage all the local and all the distributed drives on all the other systems. Right, so this is very typical of these architectures that they can go both ways. Um, and I just switched companies. This is another product, a company called Weka IO. Very similar, all software defined. In this case, they happen to present their software as a file interface instead of a block interface. And, you know, if you ask them, I'm sure they'll tell you their architecture is very unique, but it's actually pretty similar and analogous to what we're going to see with the others. It's a set of software. It runs, um, and piece of it runs as a client-side driver. It can present file services. There's all kinds of storage data services underneath the covers there, too, in these products. They're doing things like cloning, replication, snapshots, all the kinds of deduplication, all the kinds of things you would expect with storage is all buried in that layer. Uh, depending on the various product. And in this case, they can use, um, they use SSD. They actually talk directly NVMe over Fabric on the network themselves. So they are running the standard protocol and they will tier storage under the covers. So the first access is always to fast flash or why would you bother? But they also then push data down to other tiers of storage. It's very common of all these software architectures. And because it's all software and because it can be deployed in any type of target compute node, it can be deployed on something like Amazon compute nodes as well. So one of the benefits of these architectures and the benefit of really being software defined is that you just stick it in a container and you can run it on a node in Amazon if you like. You can have dedicated storage nodes in Amazon if you like. Um, and you can use uh, Amazon Object Store as well as a back end, back tier. So there's nothing in the architecture that prevents the use of 
a really wide range of architectures over time from the underlying computing infrastructure. Okay, so um, one of the other things I talked about in, virtuous, in the virtuous cycle was um, getting to cloud, right? And operating in a hybrid cloud or cloud-like environment. So some of these software-defined solutions have gone a little further and said, okay, I have a distributed architecture. I can mass amounts, huge amounts of, of storage, but then present it as a single logical drive, right? And they're presenting that logical drive typically to a container or a VM. Right? In, especially in a cloud environment, everything is a container. So um, some have gone further and said, you know, I can take this distributed architecture and have it not only provide storage, but provide pretty much an entire private cloud environment. Um, and so Deterra is an example. Again, there are more than, uh, there are several companies that do this. They've basically taken a software-defined architecture, a software-defined storage architecture, and said, instead of presenting to you a block volume or a file, I'm going to present a logical chunk of storage right into a, an appropriate container. So I'm going to provide uh, a volume, a virtual disk, into a Docker container or into a particular type of VM. They just skip all those layers underneath. Forget the fact that it's a file or not a file, given what you need for your container. Um, and these guys take that another step further. They said, well, it's all software. I'm providing these services. What I'll do is let the container or the application define well, how much storage and what characteristics it's going to have. So the benefit of having this whole architecture and software is that these data services can now be tailored per container. I could have one container that gets deduplicated, block storage, and I could have another container that gets non-deduplicated but replicated storage, right, depending on the requirements of each container. And the second thing that some of these companies do with these architectures in software is they say, you know, I can provide isolation. Since I'm providing storage specifically to a virtual machine or a container, I can isolate the storage that that container has completely from other containers. Now, it's logical, right? Software, we've aggregated massive amounts of physical uh, storage capability into you know, what gets presented to an individual. But in the software, now I can also isolate those containers and all the storage associated with them. So you get all kinds of properties of multi-tenancy and security. But again, it's the same software-defined storage architecture as a building block. So uh, Deterra is an example. They will cluster, uh, they will actually find, discover, and cluster up any storage they can find. They can tell if it's fast, medium, or slow. They take all the SSD and cluster it up as fast storage. And then they have a, a way that they present that logical, uh, a logical device, a virtual disk, straight to an application uh, that's containerized. And um, then they make the decision about where it gets allocated. And in making that decision, they also provide all kinds of multi-tenancy and security features. And again, this could be deployed in hyper-converged environment where I package up some aggregated storage and I present it to the VM that's right there in the same box. Or I can have a whole bunch of rack scale storage nodes and I can aggregate up that storage and present individual uh, virtual disks to containers that are running on other nodes or even in the cloud. So again, it allows for very flexible architectures, same underlying principle, it's software defined, it has a distributed underlying architecture for aggregating storage, and then they're now using that software layer to provide an additional set of services. And again, this, in this case, they let the application decide all the rules for storage. So instead of having generic storage data services, all the services provided for an application are defined by that application. Uh, does it want replication? What level of performance? Does it want snapshots? All those kinds of things. Those are all built in and defined at the time that that virtual storage is created for a container. Very powerful. Uh, Hedvig is another example that is very similar to Deterra. They're focused on providing a distributed storage architecture. They provide virtual disks directly to a VM or a container. Uh, again, it's the exact same story. Uh, it can be applied in hyperconverged or hyperscale because it's just software. It's a set of data services that knows how to collect and aggregate storage from, from all kinds of uh, thousands of nodes uh, in a cluster and bring them to bear to a particular VM or application. Now the last, one of the other steps that I think is important that's happening now um, 
and it also builds on this idea of a software-defined distributed storage architecture, is that there are companies um, providing a different type of different variation of that for hybrid cloud environments where maybe it doesn't make sense to have my whole cluster be extended into Amazon for performance reasons. But I do want to burst my, my video editing into, into the cloud. And so I have to have the data there, right? So these, there's a couple um, architectures developing for being really smart about making data available to users in the cloud, in multiple clouds, uh, or in a cloud and in the data center while minimizing the amount of data movement and overhead. I'm just gonna give a couple examples, but they build on many of the same principles. It's software defined, and they understand that the this underlying storage units and data is distributed, and in this case, the primary function they're providing is some form of replication of the data or cloning of the data. I'll just give a couple examples. So one is a company called DBM Cloud, and again, it's a software-only solution. They, they recognize and can, can be aware of storage that's sitting in a data center and in a cloud. In this case, it's object-to-object -object storage. And then they will make uh, smart decisions about replicating object uh, data. And they get rules uh, provided uh, pretty granular about which data needs to be available where and, in w and when. And uh, using those rules that users provide, they're very smart about making sure the data is there when it needs to be there so you can burst compute into a cloud. Um, and another variation is a company called Store Reduce. They do very similar thing. Uh, along the way, they also deduplicate the data. So again, it's just a layer of software that's providing a set of data services between distributed locations and some front end interface. And in this case, they're also S3 to S3 and they will move and, uh, and manage objects between on-premise and various clouds, and as they're moving, they will uh, deduplicate the data. Uh, just a couple examples. Again, there are, there are many more. So uh, what should we take from all of this? Uh, there, is a virtual, there is a virtuous cycle going on right now in storage that is uh, really, I think, for the first time in more than a decade, generating some exciting new architectures for storage. And these will be, I predict, that these will be the architectures that are deployed in media and entertainment because they are so well aligned with the need for both compute intensive environments and huge amount of data. Uh, to be processed against. Um, and that is, there will be distributed software-defined storage architectures. They'll be deployed uh, in hyperscale, hyperconverged, and hybrid cloud environments, depending on the desire and, and the use case. And um, they will provide a set of data services that allow tremendous high-performance access to data uh, without compromising the computing power of the system, and that uh, data and performance will be available at the right location at the right time, finally, for the kind of work that's done in media and entertainment. And I think we're, we're almost there now. I know that a number of the large studios have already deployed some of the products that I gave in this example and others that I didn't use as examples. So I know the process is underway, um, but I, I believe this is gonna be a, a real watershed moment for storage, which typically only happens once every 20 years or so. Thank you, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. And if you have any other questions or comments for me, I'd love feedback. Um, you can reach me at joan.rabbits at renaissancecg.com. Thank you.